Hi, Spring fans. Look, I am really excited about the new IntelliJ IDEA 2025.2 uh, release. This release includes a bunch of, you know, great quality of life improvements and support for some of the upcoming stuff, including Java 25, which as of the, the date of this recording is, is coming out in about a month in September, uh, Maven 4. I've been hearing about Maven 4 for a long time. When it arrives, I'll be excited. And JSpecify, which are a set of annotations developed by a consortium of different uh, contributors aimed at providing feedback about where things might be null. And this is in the Java language, because the Java language, unlike Kotlin and so many other languages, doesn't have built-in semantics for describing nullability. Uh, so for example, if you're using Spring Framework 7 and Spring Boot 4, both of which are due in November of 2025, you'll get the whole portfolio has been basically retrofitted to use these JSpecify nullability annotations that allow us to participate in this. And so when you use Spring Framework 7 and Spring Boot 4, you'll get indications in your build tool via the Spring Boot Maven and Gradle tool plugins or your IDE in IntelliJ now and, you know, everywhere else. And in, and uh, this is the whole point is your compiler doesn't give you enough information. But if you if everything else above and beyond the compiler gives you that information, then why not? And by the by, as I understand it, JSpecify actually hooks in to a lower level mechanic in the JDK itself. So it's almost like the compiler is giving you that information as well. Super useful. The reason we care about this is because nulls cause problems, right? Tony Hoare famously described nullability as the one billion dollar mistake. And so, you know, we'll talk about that in a separate video where we look at Spring Framework 7 and Spring Boot 4. Um, all that to say, I'm a big fan of this, this idea of fast feedback, right? And uh, to that end, I'm really excited about another feature that's in IntelliJ 2025.2, which is the new Spring Modulith support. So that's what we're going to take a look at today. Spring Modulith is, is meant to give you more support above and beyond the amazing Spring Debugger uh, support that they released, I think in the last release, but um, uh, that provides just a set of different integrations that give you visibility into uh, what your application is doing and you know what beans are active and uh, what profiles are in play and what the value, the resolved value given the constellation of uh, configuration properties are and so on. So I'm, I'm a big fan of the Spring Debugger, uh, but, it, but this is, it looks like separate support or it's a, in addition to or whatever, and it gives you feedback. It gives you that fast feedback so that as you're working with Spring Modulith, you can see in the IDE what is going wrong and where. And, and, and not to say what's going wrong with Spring or with Spring Modulith in particular, but with your the arrangement of your code. You see, Spring Modulith is all about arranging your code, about describing your architecture in such a way as to reduce the blast radius of change. So as you use Java, Java is an object-oriented language. It gives you tools for privacy control, right? How visible is this type? And most of us, unfortunately, make everything public and, and uh, we sort of use terrible layering approaches for our architecture. And this results in code bases that are just big Gordonian knots that are inextricably sort of knotted together and very hard to tease apart, very hard to scale. And I say this not as a hypothetical, but as a, as a core business value, right? I mean, the reason we want privacy controls in our objects is because it's an object-oriented language. The reason object orientation prizes privacy controls is because Otherwise, people could just create dependencies on your types and you'd have to have long, tedious, drawn out conversations every single time you refactor anything. Your, the, the march of progress in your code base would come to a crawl and then to a halt, right? Because everything would take forever to understand the repercussions. Uh, and so what we want is to get beyond that, to get to a place where the code is as minimal as possible, where we don't export things unnecessarily, and that whenever we do export, we do so intentionally, and that we have guardrails that go beyond the controls that the compiler already affords us to enforce those those restrictions and where needed to also support those restrictions. Remember, this implies some constraints in how we communicate at runtime from one module, you know, a package, if you will, in, in the code base to another. And so Spring Modulus provides that runtime support as well. So let's take a look at all that, as always, by going to my second favorite place on the internet, start.spring.io. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a new application. I'll use the dev tool support. I'll use Spring Modulus. I'm going to use the GraalVM native image support. I'll use the web support. And I'm going to be using Spring Data JDBC and the Postgres support. Now, obviously, Spring Modulus is the brainchild of Oliver Dropbomb, the legendary Oliver Dropbomb, who was the second lead and uh, longest serving lead of Spring Data. So believe me when I say it, this works quite well with a number of different persistent stores, not just, you know, SQL and JDBC, but uh, I'm going to be using that, okay, just because that's what I've got set up here. So let's go ahead and hit generate and open this up in our ID. Now I've got a database table called dog here, and we have, you know, 
18 dogs and uh, we're going to try and build some software to adopt dogs and in particular we're going to adopt Prancer whose ID is 45, his name is Prancer and he's described as a demonic, neurotic, man-hating, animal-hating, children-hating dog that looks like a gremlin and uh, for the moment his uh, owner is Jlong. Let's set that back to null for the demo. Okay, so update dog set owner equals null. Okay, now for the moment his owner is empty. There's our zip file. Let's open this up. And as I said, we're going to connect to a Postgres database that's already running. So first things first, spring data source, password is secret, username is my user, URL jdbc colon Postgres QL localhost my database. Okay. All right. So what we want to do is build an application to support adoptions. Okay. I'll create a package here called adoptions. There I'll create a dog adoption controller. Now I could create a Java class the old fashioned way like this. But if I do that, notice that it gives me a public type, which I don't want, right? So nicely, the uh, IntelliJ folks have this new menu, spring component, and I want a dog adoption, right, let's say controller. Notice that as I move through the list, it's automatically filling in the uh, the bits there. Oops, it's done the wrong thing there. So we want to say controller, okay? All right, notice that it's not public. Isn't that nice? Very, very nice. And it's got uh, request mapping. I don't want that, but what I do want is at response body, okay? Okay, so I've got a controller that in turn is going to delegate to a dog adoption service. Okay, and I shall indicate as much by making this service. I'll make it a transactional. It's going to have a method here to adopt dogs given their dog ID and the new owner name. Okay, well, how am I going to talk to the SQL database? Well, of course, I'll be using spring data JDBC. Okay, so spring name, string name, string owner, string description. Okay and I'll model this here. I'm creating a, an entity and I just love Java records. I just love them so, so much. They're just so good. So I'll use that. I'm going to create a repository here, dog repository, extends list of crud repository, managing entities of type dog, whose primary key is a type integer. Okay. And I'll say private final dog repository, add that to the constructor here. And you know, I'm going to just delegate it to it. So we'll say repository at find by ID, dog ID, ID if present, then we're going to update it. So we'll say updated equals this repository dot save new dog. And then, you know, pass in the ID dog dot name owner and description, and we'll just print it out updated updated. Okay. Good stuff. So there's the, uh, the basic flow. Now, obviously we face an existential question, which is if we've implemented a service, but we didn't export it over the internet, did we actually build the service? And the, the answer is no, the answer is no. So we're going to go ahead and add this controller here, dog ID adoptions, void adopt, int dog ID, string owner. Okay. And you know, you can imagine we're just going to delegate. Look how I'm using these collaborating objects. I don't even have to define the constructor or the injection or anything like that. I just start typing and the IDE figures out that I intend to inject that type and make use of it. And I do. So good stuff. That's going to be a path variable. That's the request parameter. Okay. I think I'm happy with all this, right? So all we've done is you call this HTTP endpoint it calls the service and the service in turn works with the repository to find and then update a single dog instance, replacing the owner parameter, the attribute, the field, the, the entity, the column, whatever in that, in that object. Okay. Let's try this out. Let's go ahead and start it up. Okay. And so now, you know, HTTP 80, 80 dogs, 45 adoptions, owner equals J long, and we'll say it's a form and we intend to do a post. Okay, good. And we get the updated dog blah. Okay, that's worked, but is that real? Surely not. Right? In most jurisdictions, you have to do a far sight more than just updating one column and one table to uh, to take to take possession of a live animal. So let's suppose I have another package here called vet, and there I'll put a class for the you know it's a veterinarian, right? It's a doctor for the dog. So I shall call it a dog tour. Now I can I can make this a component, and I can have a method here, public void. I don't want to adopt. I want to check up, right? So here's that check up int dog id system out checking up on dog id okay and go back over here to the adoptions and i'm going to go back over here to my service and you know i i have just i'm going to call that collaborating object i'm going to call that collaborating object i'll say doctor.checkup dog id like that and you know i think that's good let's try it out go back over here post again and it says checking up on and updated right so it's done it we're decoupled isn't that great we're we're we're, we're, we're coupled but we're sort of decoupled, right? I've injected, I've got a concern, I've extracted it out to a separate object. That feels okay. And this is a dependency, but there are two dependencies across these root packages. And so far, everything's fine, right? You can see in the spring module, 
badging here on the folder icon. This is a new thing in IntelliJ. It's telling me that this is a root package. It's a root module. It is public. It's open for, for consumption, right? The types there are open. And that's what I've done. I've got the same open icon over here. And I've got a dependency from, from here to here, OK? Or rather, from here to there, if I can only if I can only land those clicks. So now I go back over here. I don't know if this is actually a proper dependency. The return value, you might notice, is, is void. I don't actually depend on the result. So maybe adding this was the wrong move. Let's back that out and look at ways to involve the dog tour, right, without actually injecting it. Maybe we don't need that hard dependency there. So instead, what I'll do is I'll use events, right? And Spring has great support for publishing events, and it's had it there for decades. So I'm going to create a public type, my first intentionally public type, and I'll say public record int Okay, and I'll say int dog ID, and that's it. Maybe I'll just, maybe that's how I'm going to propagate. I go back to my controller, go back to the service, and I'm going to publish now an event. I'll say application event publisher, new dog adoption event. And notice that this application event publisher, again, it's been here since 1.1.1 for decades, right? Since, since uh, 2004, I think. And it's now 2025 as, as of this recording. So, you know, the math is easy. It, this, this version of Spring can drink alcohol in the United States. That's how old that is, okay? Okay, so I don't know if that's if that's true. If I've published an event, then I can remove the public. I'm not communicating in terms of that di direct dependency. I can use Spring Frameworks at event listener. So dog adoption event. Just inject that like so. Okay, good. Reload, and we're gonna publish the same request one more time. And what do we got? It says updating and checking up on. Nice. Same result as before, except now these things don't know about each other. I'm communicating in terms of events, and that's exactly what we want. That decoupling. We're nice and we're nice and decoupled. But what happens? Just to, just hear me out. What, let's, let's just try it out. To explore the space. What happens if I uh, sleep for five seconds? Okay. Let's just let's see what happens. Uh oh, I made a request, and I made the request in one module, but I'm being delayed in the other, and the result of the processing is is taking five seconds longer than it was before. I wonder what could have I wonder what could have started that five second delay. Well, yeah, obviously this, right? And that implies something. That implies that these events are being dispatched in the same thread as the publisher. So one option is to use at Spring Frameworks at async, right? At async will start the invoked method in a separate thread. And it's had the effect we expected, which is that it returned immediately. It's print out, updated, and five seconds later, it prints out checking up on. But what happens if I lose the state here? Remember, one of the nice things about being in the same trans same thread is that you can be in the same transaction. So if this failed to complete, then the first operation in the first in the controller would also get rolled back, and so you'd have a consistent state. But now it's very possible that I do something in the first controller, it commits and writes to the database, and then you know five seconds later this fails to finish. Maybe the power got yanked out of the computer or whatever, and as a result this is no longer working. So that's not good. So what I want is to get, you know, I want my asynchronous cake and to eat it too. So what I'll use is Spring Modulus Application Module Listener, which is a meta annotation. You go here, it's got at async, at transactional, and at transactional event listener, all of which do what we had before and some, some more. So we compare this with some nice configuration here. So we'll say module republished outstanding events on restart is true, and module scheme initialization is true. Okay. So once I've got that in place, let's go back to the the code base over here, and you know we'll try it again. What do you think? Okay, publish, return immediately. That's nice. Go back over here. You can see it says updated, and now five seconds later, there it appears the checking up on. So this has given us the best of both worlds. We've created a asynchronous system. They're asynchronous, truly asynchronous. But how do I know that that will get handled if something should go wrong? Well, Spring Modulus created a new table. So let's go over here. You can see there's a table here called event publication. There's one record. Okay. And you can see there's a publication date and then the next row there's a completion date. So there should be two dates here. This is the publication date and then one column over there's the completion date. Post again. Go over there. Rerun that. And now I've got two rows, right? But there's no completion date over here, right? The the This is one row. This is two. And there's no completion date like there's down here. That's because it hasn't been completed yet. Run this again, and by you know five seconds later, presumably it'll have been completed. Isn't that nice? That's nice. That's really nice. And that means it's keeping track of what's been done and what hasn't. This is a sort of transactional outbox pattern, right? This is the idea that I'm reconciling non-transactional state against a transactional ledger, like a SQL database. Okay. 
and Spring Mod just keeps track of what's not been done. It'll replay those missed messages. So let's demonstrate that. I'll make a request one more time, quickly go over to my application, stop the process before the five seconds has had a chance to lapse, and then restart. And we should, hands off the keyboard, we should see that it's gonna replay the missed message. There you go, checking up on dog adoption ID. So there, there's the replayability that I was talking about, right? It's gonna get handled eventually. Now, obviously this is just on restart, Obviously, you could you could do your own thing. You could have something that you know when the application you could have a at scheduled, for example, fixed rate equals a thousand milliseconds or whatever, right? And then void, you know, replay, and then you could inject springs. Let's say static class runner go there at component. There you go. Let's just do incomplete event publications dot resubmit, right? And now you can every one second decide which event gets republished so that you can reprocess. You can also filter out things that are older than a certain threshold that maybe you don't care about. You can look at the nature of the event, the characteristics of the event. Is it something where you don't care if you replay that event because it's lossy, like logging, or maybe you do care, like it's some business transaction, whatever. So you can do all sorts of things and control how these events are replayed. But by default, that property that I showed you, the replay outstanding events on restart, uh, will do the work for you on restart. Now. I think things are looking up. We've got nice modular code. Things are decoupled. But how do I know? Like, I, I mean, I just told you, right? So I guess that's something. But how do I actually know? Well, one way to find out is to write a test, as with all things in the world. So let's just do that. We'll do application modules of adoptions application class. We're going to say am.verify. We're going to print out the modules as well. Heck, we can even document the modules. Let's do that over here as well. Okay. So let's run this test. Okay. Tests green. And Spring Modulith seems to know about the arrangement of our modules in the code base, and it knows how they relate to each other. This has a dependency. Uh, this has a bean called dogtor. Uh, this has beans called controller service and dog repository, etc. So all is well and good, but how do I know if it's not well and good? What does that look like? Well, the Spring Modulith is it has certain heuristics backed by a project called ArchUnit or ArcUnit, architecture ArcUnit, right? Uh, and this is meant to capture violations of your architecture. So for example, if you have one module that depends on another and then that other one then depends on the first one, that's a cycle, right? So you'll you'll get a, a warning for that. Or if you leak what are intended to be package private or implementation packages, that'll be a violation as well. So let's, uh, let's suppose I have a sub package here in adoption called validations, right? And notice that the icon the badging in Spring in, in Spring Modulith and IntelliJ has changed. This is a private locked package. So let's go over here. I'll say at component, and you know it's public. It has to be public so that I can talk to it and use it from other parts of the code base. But I I surely don't intend to use it elsewhere, just in the adoptions package, right? So let's suppose I inject it here. Does that change anything? Add that to the constructor. Everything seems fine. No errors. Now let's run the test. Let's run the test. Okay. Everything seems fine. Good. Now what if I go to the other component, the other module, and I inject, inject the validations in there. So this is a package private sort of implementation detail from the doc adoptions package that I'm now depending on in my in my vet package, right? Is that going to work? It doesn't seem like it should work. Let's try the test first and notice that the error, let's try the test first. Okay, the test has failed. It's saying, hey, module vet depends on non-exposed type validation within module adoptions. And what is this new squiggly line inside of IntelliJ? Module vet depends on non-exposed type validation, right? It's giving me the same feedback instantaneously. I didn't have to run the test. This was there before I even ran the test. I now see instantaneously when I've run afoul of good, clean architecture design. So this is a very, very useful quality of life improvement. This, this will make me make it so I can move a lot more quickly. Big fan of this. Well done to the JetBrains IntelliJ team for so nicely and effortlessly integrating the support into the ID.